trial lawyer, national media personality, and novelist, Mike Papantonio, on this edition of Conversations. Mike Papantonio's courtroom prowess has made him one of the nation's preeminent trial lawyers. His winning verdicts reach well into the millions. Papantonio has earned a reputation for taking on tough and complicated cases against defendants with abundant resources. Many of those adversaries have found out the hard way. Papantonio's passion, determination, and legal flair is hard to combat. In 2015, Mike Papantonio joined an elite group. He was inducted into the National Trial Lawyers Hall of Fame. Outside the courtroom, he is known for astute political commentary. He created Ring of Fire Networks, a multimedia platform which includes a national radio show. His analysis is often heard on cable news outlets like MSNBC and Fox News. Papantonio has authored several books, his latest a novel entitled Law and Disorder, a suspenseful story that draws on Papantonio's extensive legal career. We welcome Mike Papantonio to this edition of Conversations. Thank you for joining us. Good to be here, Jeff. Tell me about the book. Well, you know, the, for years I've handled um, cases that have had a lot of political overlies to them. Uh, whether it is a case against a pharmaceutical company, a case against Wall Street, uh, whatever it may be, they've always had those kind of political intrigue sto sides right. to them. And I just had enough people say, you know, you ought to write that sometimes. And rather than writing a nonfiction, I thought it was just best to put it in a fiction. My, my goal really has been, Jeff, to somebody can pick up the book uh -huh. and they can, read, uh, they can read a chapter and they, be entertained but at the same time, they come away uh, from just being entertained. They learn something. Right. And that's what these books, there's, there's, uh, there's three of them that are in line here. And this is the first of them. And the whole idea is to kind of tell the back stories about the practice of law and some of the politics and cultural and social issues that all tie into that. Mm -hmm. Hopefully you can read it on the beach, walk away and say, it's a good story, but I learned something. What would the average person... Um be most surprised about the, 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 the back end of what goes on in the law field? I think probably they'd be most shocked at the, the pharmaceutical aspect of that, of that particular book. Uh, the, the, the pharmaceutical story, the, the, what happens when a drug goes on the market? What happens when a person actually takes a drug that they believe that the FDA had, had overseen and the FDA had given approval on? The stories, uh, the, it's not the type of thing that corporate media tip, typically can tell. They have advertisers, whether it's uh, whatever the pharmaceutical company is, they have advertisers that do business with that pharmaceutical company. So those backstories are rarely told. They'll see the headlines where maybe Merck or Pfizer or one of the big pharmaceutical companies is hit for a big verdict, but they really don't know why. They don't understand what took place. Who is it that destroyed documents? Who is it that, that, that tampered with the clinical data? How did they sell it to the media? Why did the media, why did the media ignore it? How did the FDA ignore it? How did, they, how did they make their way through an FDA bureaucracy in such a way that basically they get everything they want when they want it? Those aren't the kinds of things that people hear about. Right. Uh, but that's one part of the story. Um, and, and I think that, I don't think you'll find a book that explains that, certainly not in a fiction. Um, you know, Grisham, I've, I've always thought Grisham is very good mm -hmm. at telling a story. But at the same time he's telling the story, you walk away and say, gee, I didn't know that that's how judges were appointed. I didn't know that a judge had that much authority to do X, Y, or Z. Right. Uh, I didn't know that uh, how you remove a judge from a bench. Those types of things Grisham would always pack into his novels. And I thought that was, that always captured my interest because Although he was an attorney, he really he, he really didn't try cases. He wasn't a trial lawyer. This this book, uh, these this these series of books, take on the aspect of what does it really look like at ground zero. Mm. It's one thing to describe a courtroom scene, but it's another thing to take a courtroom scene that actually took place, and you go, my gosh, that can't be real, and it is real. Wait, there's courtroom scenes in this particular book, and you'll go, surely that didn't happen, and they really did happen. Tell me about the characters in here, the main character, Deke, yeah. right? Yeah, Nicholas Deke Thomas, is, uh, he's, a, he's an attorney that handles basically big products cases all over the country. 
uh, he is, his goal in, in every one of the cases is to be able to get to trial and get, obviously get a result for the claimant. But most of the time, what he's trying to do is if there's a product out there and it ought to be off the market, his, his goal is to get it off the market. So he's operating on all four cylinders in the right way. He wants to accomplish the right thing for the right reason, and he does well doing that. Um, so he's a character that uh, I really, uh, he, he's a composite character in okay. the sense that I, I looked around the country and I said, you know, I've worked with, with really some of the finest trial lawyers in the country. And I've uh, borrowed a little bit here and borrowed a little bit there. I've put the barnacles on them when they needed barnacles. Right. And so there's, it's not a, certainly he's not a whitewashed character. You don't lend it and say, oh my gosh, this, this guy, this guy's perfect. <laughs> he's far from it. Right, right. And so as the books, as the books continue, you learn that each one of the characters in there kind of have a little darker side than what you might think when you read it initially. I was going to ask you how much of Mike Papantonio is in Deke? Well, I think it's impossible to write a book like that without drawing on your personal experience. I mean, the, the old adage is, write what you know about. Right, right. <laughs> and certainly you know yourself, <laughs> and you certainly know... Um, you certainly know the topics well. So it's impossible for me to say that there's no part of that that is, that's there. I, 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 have, I obviously used this area heavily. Right. I think anybody reading it is going to say, I, and I changed the names. I, I gave the characters different names. I changed the areas, gave them different names. But at the end of it, the reading, they're going to know what it's about. Now, I think every author does that somewhat. If you take a look at um, uh, Balducci or uh, Grisham, any of, the, any of the thriller writers, they always start off with the thing that they know. It may be their hometown. It may be some experience they had in some aspect of law. Um, and so that's what this is. So there's there's certainly a little bit of me there, but I didn't intend to say Nick Dicotomus is my Antonio. <laughs> okay. That's not my intent. I'm always curious how novelists. I'm always curious about their process. Mm. What, what was your process of putting this together? Well, I think anybody that writes fiction <laughs> will tell you that the most difficult thing is, and it shouldn't be difficult, but the most difficult thing is is the narrative, mm -hmm. the the conversations. How do you go back in there and you and I are talking right now, and how do we capture what's happening here uh, cleanly? quickly in a way that actually means something. What, what, is the, what, what is interesting and unique about that conversation? The storylines in a story in these books are fairly easy because they really happened. Mm -hmm. But, all, but you, you take what really happened and you put the fiction aspect, you, you, you add the intrigue to it, you add the thriller aspect of it, you add the aspect of, my gosh, I hope this works out for the character. <laughs> you know, you take all of those things. But the real trick to me is, in, is, is trying to take that character and say, how would they, how would they talk? How would they interact with their children? How would that character interact with his wife? How would these two lawyers interact? And it's, it sounds like it's fairly easy because all you do is say, well, people talk this way. But when you're writing a book and space is an issue, right. you know, brevity is an issue, right. and getting the idea across uh, quickly is, 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 is an issue. Yeah. So those narratives are very important. How long did it take you to massage this character into the person you wanted him to be? <laughs> if, if you read that, actually the editor, you know, every, every, uh, I think every author ends up getting really angry with the editor. Because <laughs> as I, as I, when I finished that, I, I would say to the editor, well, you know, I kind of like this part. Why, why did you take it out? <laughs> be, be, and, they, and these are professionals. They right. understand because you want them to turn the page. Right. You don't want to get bogged down on the nuances to where they say, you know, uh, Mishner, for example, Mishner was uh, excelled at taking the, the, a pineapple, and he would say, well, what's the story of the pineapple? And Mishner could tell you every aspect of the pineapple, but that wasn't intrigue, you right. see. These types of thriller novels, the, the reason I, <laughs> I think I was so upset about what was cut <laughs> is those were stories that I, those were parts of the stories I really liked, <laughs> and, but you have to, at, you know, at the end of all of it, you have to really... Uh, you have to have some trust in some in, in good editors, and, and and that's what I did here. Who's your favorite author? I would well, I think the classic author would be Steinbeck. Okay. You know, I, I 
Um, I remember one time before I went to law school, there was, a, there was a great lawyer by the name of Perry Nichols. He was an attorney down in Arcadia, Florida, one of the places I lived growing up. And he had a cattle ranch down there. And I was getting ready to move into journalism. I was going to be a journalist and hopefully do foreign correspondence. Every, I think everybody at University of Florida in the journalism program wanted to do that right. when they were coming through. But somebody said to me, you know, Mike, you really ought to think about going to law school. And I said, I really don't have any interest, but I'll go talk to this person you want me to talk to. And, I, and Perry Nichols was at the time... Melvin Belli quality. I mean, he was he was truly the Clarence Darrow of his time. He was a wonderful lawyer. He was out of uh, his his home was out of Miami, Florida, but he gravitated uh, and ended up kind of settling up around North Florida. So I went to meet him, and I, you know, in kind of an inartful way, I said, you know, uh, Mr. Nichols, what do you think made you such a, an important lawyer? And so, so I didn't know that I really wanted to hear the answer, but the answer was spectacular. He was in a he was in a wheelchair sitting in front of this wall, and the wall was full was full of books, and on there was Steinbeck, Kafka, uh, Conrad, Hemingway, all of the great novelists. And he said, "Well, to answer your question, he said, first of all, it started with me reading all those books up there." And what he was trying to say is there really no new ideas. Uh -huh. You know, if for, for a trial attorney not to have a real big, big background and a lot of interstitial information about other ideas, other concepts, I think is a big mistake. And that's what Perry Nichols was trying to tell me. And so my, my reading coming up what were those people. They were Kafka, Conrad, Hemingway, Steinbeck, uh, you know, on and on that you would say are kind of the classical Classic writers, not classical writers, but right, right. well-known writers that right. that uh, kind of kind of moved me. What was was he the turning point in your life that made you say, "I want to be an attorney"? Was he had a big impact on it, Jeff. A big impact. Um, there were other issues, you know. At a young, I, again, my I, I think I was really committed more to journalism, mm -hmm. but uh, I had I, I remember reading, um, you know, To Kill a Mockingbird, right. and. There's no way that a young person comes out of reading To Kill a Mockingbird to say, you know, I'd like to do something like that. I'd like to end my life and career in a way that it has some substantial impact on somebody or something. Right. Well, you've certainly had a big impact, and I know a lot of the cases that you've worked on have been uh, geared towards environmental issues. Yeah, they have been. What I've always tried to do is I've tried to take on a big environmental case every few years. Mm -hmm. They're just so overwhelming that you won't, you can only do so many. Um, and the results I've had, you know, have been good. There's no question. But you can't get those kinds of results by taking on too many. Mm -hmm. They have to be the kind of case where you say, my gosh, if I don't solve this, uh, the latent aspects of the damage to people is going to be huge. Uh, I'm involved with a project like that up in Ohio right now against DuPont, where DuPont, uh, they poisoned the drinking water of 70,000 people. They poisoned it with something called C8. And they knew when they did it, they'd been doing it for, for 50 years, they'd been dumping just millions of pounds of this into the Ohio River, and it ended up in people's drinking water. Hmm. And they knew when they were doing it that the, 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 the product caused cancer. In the last two cases I've tried up there have been horrible cancer cases. And um, so that's the type of thing that I, I walk away and I say, well, are, are we going to accomplish anything by this? You know, it's not just can we clean up this, this stream. It is can we save lives? Can we let people know that this stuff is in the environment for uh, 5 million years, this C8, that it's in your human body for 25 years. Mm. So this is the kind of stuff that I believe does have an impact, but you, in, in reality, you, if you're going to have a life, if you're going to have, you know, when you have a child, when you have a family, that's such an important priority. And you have to say, well, I can't do them all. I'll, I'll pick them carefully. What is it about these big companies or anyone, once they realize that they're doing something that is causing a great deal of harm, why don't they stop? Mm. Why does it continue on? Well, why do they cover up there's a on? quick answer to it. First of all, I, you're talking to somebody who believes that capitalism is the best system in the world. I mean, if you look all over the world, Capitalism works when it's regulated, when there is a, where there's a, there's a common goal. Let's, a common goal is let's do well for everybody. Let, let's do well by doing some good, right. okay? 
What ends up hap what's happened in the last um, it used to be 25, 30 years ago, a CEO would move through a company and that CEO might be there for 20 years. They might begin their career there and end their career right. in a large company. And then what ended up happening in MBA school was the, what we call uh, a quick profits, big risk. And uh, those are my terms. I don't know they teach those terms in MBA school, but here's what it is. You're moving through in three years. You're going to go to a company like DuPont. You're going to be there for three, five at the max. And what you're going to do is you're going to maximize that 10K at the end of every quarter. You're going to say, did I raise that 10K even one-eighth of one penny? Because mm -hmm. if I did, I'm going to make more money. So the whole system is built around that. The way that we pay CEOs is built around that way. And so the compensation issue has changed all that. We don't really have a CEO that says, you know, I've been here for 20 years. I want to end my career by not passing something on to the next CEO that has, that has the uh, potential to do horrible damage to people. And so um, that, that, I think, is one of the biggest things. And I think, I, I think probably the next biggest thing is that you don't have media really asking the tough questions. You know, you, you've, got, you've got somewhat of a corporate media now, mm -hmm, mm -hmm. and corporate media is driven by how many advertising dollars do they sell. And because of that, they don't go and ask the tough questions, and the CEOs know they can get away with it. Yeah, the That's investigative what, journalism is not what it used to no, be. No, there are no more Ed Morrows. There are more, no, no more Walter Cronkites or Huntley and Brinkley. Right, right. Uh, we've moved to, again, just like the quick profits, big risk, same thing with corporate media, exactly the same thing. I want to come back to media in just a moment because you're involved in that as well. But before I do so, what case are you most proud of? I would say probably it just happened to be a local case around here. It was, um, it was a case against a company uh, used to be called Conoco. And w for so many years, the Conoco um, and its predecessor and, you know, everybody in charge of the, the decision-making had really polluted uh, Biotar and some areas around. And there, there was never a time when anybody really looked to find out how bad it was, you know, to find out really what was actually going on. And I, I think I... I invested my first effort into an environmental case there, knowing that I was taking myself away from other cases, such as pharmaceutical cases and securities cases, those types of things that, we, that I do. But I think I, the, I, was, I was most proud of that because we got a good result. And we got some. We got something done that was that was meaningful, and it it, it meant that people were at least aware that, you know, for forty some years, bad government had allowed this to take to take its own life. Mm -hmm. And uh, so there was a lot of reasons I was proud of that. I don't know that that is the single most important, but that 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 was an important case to me. And along, there's been many single single cases where I've handle cases for individuals and you just love these people. I mean, you know, you just, you work with them for years, you invest everything you can as far as your effort in it with them and they do the same thing, same to you and you feel like family and, and when you get a good result and the jury comes back and finds for your client, it is a big deal. Mm -hmm. It's a big deal because it, 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 it makes, it validates your efforts there and you know, you, you've had uh, six to twelve people here in your story and say, yeah, you should have been here. Mm -hmm. You know, what, you, what you're saying here is right and, it, and what has happened here just needs to be corrected. You're, you're known for uh, mass torts, and mm -hmm. as I understand it, you were kind of instrumental in bringing the whole mass torts uh, line of business, so to speak, for lack of a better term, to, to your law firm, to the yeah. Levin Patentonia Law Firm. First of all, what are mass torts, and uh, what makes you so good at it? Yeah, well, mass torts, people always confuse mass torts with, uh, with class actions, and they're not, they're not even close to the same thing. A mass tort is simply, it's a description of a case where it may be one pharmaceutical case. Mm -hmm. It may be one drug that has been put on the market and the FDA hasn't done their job. And because of the FDA not doing their job, sometimes it's just absolute, it's just so, so dysfunctional that they let these things get through. But it ends, up, it ends up affecting not just two or three people, it ends up affecting thousands of people. 
And there, there, I mean, I could go on forever about the cases that uh, the best description of a mass tort case probably would be the Yaz case, okay? Yaz was a birth control pill, and it was put out there uh, in competition with 50 to 60 other birth control pills. But the problem, Jeff, was is they couldn't, they couldn't make enough money just selling a birth control pill. It was, if it was just a birth control pill, it really didn't mean that much, you know, mm -hmm. because there were so many competitors. Everybody was selling birth control. So what they did is they figured out a way to market it to appeal to young women, to say, if you take this birth control pill, you're going to be slimmer. You're not going to have acne. You're going to be able to fight weight problems if you take this pill. And in, in, in fact, they never had tested any of that to know that it was actually true. And the, it was a pill that um, it was, it, it would, had a six-time higher risk of causing a DVT or a stroke than, um, than the other competitors. But so, so that pill was out on the market for years and there were, there were lawyers that kept saying, you know, Mr. Media, ABC, CBS, you ought to go cover this story. This is, this is important. My daughter's taken this. This is what happened to her. My wife mm. took it. This is what happened. And so that's how a mass, court, a mass tort case develops. Um, I'm typically hired and our firm is hired to handle cases for other lawyers throughout the country. You may have a lawyer that is an advertiser, you know, 1-800-DRUG, uh, whatever it is. They're, they're more of a marketer, and I don't, mean that in a, I don't mean that in an awful way. I just mean that's, that's what they, they focus on. You know, you've got, you've got people that just market. Mm -hmm. uh, you know, <laughs> they're right around here in this town, and, you know, so-and-so and so-and-so. And, and you go, okay, well, how about how many cases have you tried? Right. Well, we end up going and actually trying cases for those people. You know, I, and so the point, the point is you just have to be able to, uh, to do it, to do it all in mass torts. You have to understand, well, yeah, I got to, I have to, I have to educate people, but once they're in my office, I got to be able to say, I can take your case and I can try it in California if I have to, or I can try it in New York or Chicago, wherever. Right. And it's an expensive, complicated oh, scenario. Oh, yeah, right? absolutely. A typical yeah. case, a typical mass tort will uh, cost a law firm. I mean, if they're the ones actually doing all the work will cost anywhere from uh, 6 to $18 million, somewhere in that area. Incredible. Yeah. Let's switch over to media. You have a pretty strong media background. You've been doing it for, what, close to two decades now? <laughs> <laughs> so, right at two decades, yeah. yeah, yeah. yeah. Okay. Tell me about Ring of Fire. Ring of Fire was an idea that really sprung up out of um, Bobby Kennedy and I have been friends for a very long time. And we were actually asked to do... Uh, a show on something that used to be called Air America, right? And it was a, it was an attempt by by progressives. I mean, it was Janine Garofalo, Chuck D, uh, Al Franken. It was just a wonderful uh, Rachel Maddow, Liz mm -hmm. Winstead, and so we were all in there, and we were asked to do some programming for this entity called Ring, called Air, Air America. So that's where we started. And then Air America didn't, it didn't hold together. Everybody ended up, first of all, the finances of it didn't hold together. But what came out of it, it was brilliant because everybody went their own way and they did their own thing. And that was critical. Yeah. You have another television project you're working on, right? Or yeah, I do. Right now, uh, RT International is, uh, is, a, is a network out of, well, it's, a, it's an international network. If you go to RT International to any country in the world, you're going to see RT International, they're making a move into the United States. And they've asked me to do a program called America's Lawyer, where we interview, you know, we interview lawyers who have these huge cases from all over the country. Mm -hmm. And they tell the backstories. They name names. They say, this judge did this. This legislator did this. This FDA person did this. And here was the net result of it. So I'm going to start that um, in October, okay. and it runs out of Washington, D.C., but we're going to do it right here in Pensacola. They've uh, you know, built a studio here, and it's going to run right here, and it'll show in every English-speaking country in the world. Wow. That was just part of the arrangement. Mm -hmm. And so, um, but I'm excited about doing it. You know, I'm a little bit tired of doing politics. I'm, I'm, 
<laughs> I started off doing politics all the way back to uh, Fox News, where I was the only progressive or liberal <laughs> on a panel, and it would be me against three other people, and they'd yell at me for about four minutes, and I tried not to yell back, but I found I had to, <laughs> just to be heard. <laughs> so I did that a couple of years, and then I did uh, I, I did a little bit of CNN, uh, not, not real regular, MSNBC I ended up doing pretty regularly. Mm -hmm. And so um, uh, Ed Schultz, who's been a friend for so long, he I guess I did his show more often than anything else. Mm -hmm. And by the way, he's on the RT Network along with uh, Larry King. So, okay. it'd be, so it's a good lineup on RT Networks. Larry King, him, Tom Hartman. Uh, it's just a wonderful lineup of people. I have just a very short period of time left here. It must have been a quite an accomplishment for you to be inducted into the Trial Lawyers Hall of Fame. It's a pretty big deal, huh? It was a big deal. You know, there's only... Uh, I think in the state, maybe there's five of us, wow. something like that. But Fred, Fred Levin, of course, right. my partner, was also in the Hall of Fame. So it's a, it's a very big honor, I, I right. tell you that. Got about a minute and a half left. What's next for Mike Papantonio? More books? You know, that's what I enjoy doing now. And I think my, I think my family likes me doing that. <laughs> so they'd rather have me at home writing a book than they would traveling around the country trying a case. So I'm going to probably be trying, I'll be trying cases. But I'm going to be focusing a little bit on telling these stories, both through both through the media, as I've done for years, and through these books. Yeah. And uh, hopefully, uh, hopefully, people will appreciate that there's a lot of truth. There's a lot of truth to, to what happens in these books. Yeah. The only thing is not true in that one is the murder scene. <laughs> <Okay>. <laughs> if there's one thing you would like for people to kind of remember you by or think when they think of Mike Papantonio what would you mm. like for them to think about just I, quick I tell young lawyers if you can't stand in a room of a thousand people where everybody disagrees with you and still still maintain your position if you think you're right then you should not be a trial lawyer it just is not suited for you you got to be able to handle rejection handle disagreement great Mike Papantonio what a pleasure to talk with you thank you so much well, thank you Jeff I appreciate it the name of the book, Law and Disorder, Mike Papantonio. It's a legal thriller. It's a novel, first one in a series. Uh, worth a read for sure.